this video we're just going to keep nice and straightforward, nice and light, just simply doing a compound interest calculation via Excel. We'll probably look at more detailed and in-depth subjects coming up in the next couple of videos. So there's some really key key things that have come out in terms of research where I think it'd be really, really useful to have a, a look at those. Um, but so just straightforward compound interest calculation, starting off with a capital value. We'll have contributions going in. We'll do it on low, mid and high rates of investment return but also key to this one which is probably an add-on really to the, the the previous cash flow modeling that i did in another video will be to look at real and nominal rates of return as well so some people prefer using nominal rates of return others prefer real rates of return so we'll jump in and have a look at that as well i hope you find this really really useful it's really a straightforward and very useful exercise in terms of building something that you can come back and amend and adapt accordingly and, and something that you can refer to as time goes on. So we're turning the clock back a bit here. Let's go back to age, gosh, age 30. Uh, so let's go, yes, yeah, it's Mr. Pickles Jr. Let's run it through to age from age 31 to age, state pension age, which at that age would be about age 68. And as before, we'll go for our, oops, sorry, low, mid and high rates of return. And we'll also pop in some nice contributions as well and add a bit of color as well up a bit. And we'll go for a nice little current value box. And let's say we're starting off with age 30, not unrealistic to say that you might be able to get to a value of about £10,000 by age 30. So if, let's assume it's um, pension contributions going in. And again, we'll box that off £10,000 and we'll drop that into our box here at the top. As before, if we want to drag that across, we want to keep that same um, that same box there. We just need to, nice and simple, and I learned this in the last video, um, F4 that. And then we can just pull that across for our starting rate of capital at the beginning. So let's then jump to our, let's start building our assumptions. So we're going, going to have our CPI at we'll say at 2% to two decimal points. And then we'll jump into thinking about, let's do our low, mid, and our high rates of return. And for change, we're gonna do this in, we're gonna do this in real rates of return. So we'll have our nominal value on the left, and we've got our real value on the right. So we've got a formula to work out the real rate of return. So we'll pop that in here. So it's always useful to have it uh, on the table. So for reference, so we've got N will be the nominal value. I will be our inflation rate. And the actual formula for this is open brackets, one plus, and our nominal rate of return, N, close brackets, then we have to divide that and then again open brackets one plus our inflation rate i close brackets and then minus one relatively straightforward but we we'll can we'll run through that in this example up here so let's use we'll use the sea's prescribed rates of return so we'll go one and oh, let's just make sure we've got this all as percentages and let's just so we've got nominal rates of return one percent four percent mid rate and seven percent high and then to work out the real rate of return we're then just going to use this formula down here so we're going to do our equals bracket one plus our nominal rate of return which is right there one percent there close brackets and then divide that and then again open brackets as per our formula down here, one plus our inflation rate, which is 2%, close brackets, minus one, which is a logical outcome, right? Because we've got our nominal rate of return, if our fund is growing by 1% every single year, in normal terms, it is increasing in value. But obviously, if our inflation rate is at 2%, then effectively, we are actually decreasing by 0.98% per year in real terms. So obviously, we're losing the purchasing power of that money over, t over time because we're simply not able to grow it above 
the rate of inflation. So at our mid rate, that'll be slightly different. So again, equals bracket one plus nominal rate of return four divided by open bracket one plus inflation rate close bracket minus one. So real rate of return is 1.96% based on a nominal value there. And then for our 7%, 4.9% so we can then just drag this, we can, we can use these numbers now, our real rates of return, for then compounding these this value, and then we'll add in some contributions as well. So as before, the formula is, we need to do equals, and then we're gonna grab our number above that, we're gonna times that, which is the asterisk button, or number eight on the keyboard, one plus, our inflation rate so we're doing our low rate and we're doing it for on real basis just make sure you're choosing the right box depending on which you're looking to do real or nominal and as before we could just f4 that which grabs that box and then we'll actually we'll do we'll add in some we haven't got a contribution there at the moment but we'll add in a contribution as well so then we can be in the position where we can just drag all of that down and it should give us, so effectively our 10,000 pounds is gradually losing value every single year up to age 68. And we've got no contributions going in and then it's going. So it's a pretty bad, pretty awful position to be in. And we'll do that same for the mid rate. So equals our 10,000 pounds times open bracket one plus our mid rate of growth, F4 plus, and we'll grab a contribution as well. Same again, and we'll do that for the high rate as well. So sum, one plus, Let's assume a £35,000 for Mr. Pickle's son, age 30. And so we can just let's grab that. And I'm we'll assume he's doing the minimum in terms of pension contributions going in. So 1.08. So £2,800 per year going in as a contribution per year for Mr. Pickle's son. Now, the one thing to mention here in terms of the contributions going in is that we could just grab this and keep it flat. So 2,800 pounds per going in per year. If we're doing it, in, and we are in this instance doing it in real terms. So in effect, we could just leave this level because this, the assumption here is that we're not increasing our contributions and we're just leaving them as they are. But of course, even with pay increases, if, if there are pay increases coming through and the pay increases are matching the 2%, then in theory, these will remain the same in terms of the real value of those contributions going in. Now, if this was in nominal terms, then potentially we could be increasing these contributions each year because they would actually be going up in value uh, each year in line with any pay rises or pay increases that are coming through. So th this potentially, this is really how I like to do um, contributions getting paid in. You could do these monthly. So if you think about how this is being calculated, this is being calculated on the basis that the, the interest, the increase in, in, in investment returns is being added at the start of the period, and then the contribution is coming in afterwards. So the contribution that's being paid in in this instance isn't actually benefit benefiting from any investment returns in this year. So it's the more conservative way of doing these 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 models. You've got your contribution getting paid in, but it's it's arriving in at the end of the year, so it's not benefiting from any investment returns. So it's a much more conservative way of doing it. You could do it monthly. On which, in which basis the, the monthly contributions would then actually benefit from the interest or the investment return being obtained in that year. And so we can drag those contributions down. Let's say he's gonna to work to age 60, then he then effectively he's had enough. Contributions make a huge difference to that eventual outcome 
for Mr. Pickle's age. He can access this pot if he's age 30 now, then he'll be able to access this money currently at age, let's just highlight that, at age 57, based on the rules in terms of the accessibility. If we are going to assume this is a personal pension plan, then he'll be able to access this at age 57. And obviously, again, the difference in terms of those growth rates, but also we can get a sense of actually maybe from age, let's say from age 40, he, broadly speaking, looks to double those contributions and see the huge difference those increasing contributions make over that period of time. Or we could chuck in some lump sums as well, let's say he gets a decent bonus. What we do tend to see is contributions do tend to be quite low at the starting end, and then that contribution then does obviously increase over time as potentially is earning more or in the position we're a bit more comfortable uh, financially and we start to see contributions really start to rack up from around age 50 onwards later on in their career when possibly they're in a slightly better financial position and are earning slightly more as well. So hopefully that was useful. As I say, you can sort of play around with these numbers and adapt them accordingly. But it's really just trying to create a model where we can look at this and feel reasonably comfortable and confident that what we've got. Now it's always tempting to add in more detail and greater depth into these, but I wouldn't actually necessarily, um, and we've done that where we've created incredibly detailed models, the output of that isn't any better than creating something relatively simplistic and simple. I think with any of these scenarios, you're really getting to a point where you've just just the right amount of information and just the right amount of data. Any variables that you add in is just creating something which potentially is going to be less and less accurate with the greater number of variables that you're adding into it. So we're really just trying to get to a very core simplistic output to say, are we comfortable with these various scenarios, whether it's at the lower end, the mid or the, the upper end in terms of returns. Now again, you can put in um, and we do this, we put in real rates of investment return into various models. But again, it's those aren't any more realistic really than, than using the, the linear models because effectively all we're doing is we're taking historical data, sort of shoehorning it into a model. It, it gives us a good idea of what it looks like as far as a variable rate of return, but it doesn't produce anything that's gonna be any more accurate than a, than a linear model. It's interesting to use and it's useful to use but I would say it's just being mindful about how much information and how detailed you make these models. And, uh, and, and really, obviously, it's, it's all just simply projections. But obviously, the alternative is not having anything at all. And then we can just produce, if you want to, a nice little um, chart, grab our data, and we can produce a nice, very simple line graph growing over time. And anything you're changing here will obviously impact on that graph as well. So let's just call this low, mid and high. Then if we shoved in 10%, we can start to see obviously that massive difference in terms of that compounding over the years as that really gets going. And obviously we see the decline when we stop contributing in and also especially that decline in the low rate because clearly we are effectively still going backwards in, in, in real terms. As always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you found it useful. Uh, as I said before, we'll probably dump, jump into some bigger topics around retirement planning and the investment side of things as well. Uh, some quite a lot of key research which is coming out, which I think is very much needed as well in the retirement space, which has been lacking really for a number of years. So I um, hope you find it useful and, uh, and we'll get into that next time. See you then. Cheers, bye.